Okay, though, this is my proposal of maybe how the works. It would explain the details of how the Morningstar figures are described in other Jewish literature. But now this also brings up a question. If this is about the birth of the Morningstar, what would that look like? If you are trying to visualize this Pesher, what would that look like? If you were born of dawn, it already sounds like you're in a heavenly setting. If you were a star born in heaven, maybe it would look something like this. Wow. Obviously, I'm choosing my imagery very uh, uh, no, I like that. I straightforwardly. Like that. <laughs> so maybe it would look like if you are you know, a dawn goddess, you are in space, maybe like at the moon. And of course, if you're a goddess of some sort, uh, you're also giving birth to a you know regal figure. You better be a queen yourself. You better be wearing a crown. And of course, if you are a dawn goddess, you're going to be glowing like uh, like dawn itself. In other words, yeah. this imagery starts immediately making you think Revelation twelve. Yeah, absolutely. So. So I'm thinking it's like, wow, this Pesher might not just explain this title, but it might even explain the imagery of Revelation 12. Now, in particular, it's worth noting right before the first sighting of the woman, what happens before that? The temple in heaven opens up and, you know, makes loud sounds, bright light pops out, and then you see the woman. It's almost like she's emerging from the temple. Yeah. And... We are then told she is clothed with the sun, wearing a crown of stars. And interestingly, in Second Enoch, when it describes um, the sun, when the sun is rising, it says the sun puts on a crown um, at rising. So wow. this imagery makes sense. The yeah. moon at her feet. This also makes sense if she has come out of the heavenly temple and now she's at the moon, which is the border basically between the heavenly realm and the unheavenly realm. By the way, if you were if you were a Jew living in israel or whatever anyway i don't know anywhere and somebody came to you with this scripture right here you would be like that is some pagan shit right there like, <laughs> there's no way they'd be like yeah that makes sense but what's interesting about the christians in the early christian literature is it as much as it comes off as like sort of pagany it's rooted in the psalms like they are yeah. really they really are bring, marriaging the two together in a in a way that's like pretty fascinating and I, I can't lie like it's it's pretty well i this is why i think they're not just a bunch of idiots in the, in the uh you know goat herders that are living in the in the desert like there's no way yeah. i know people i know that's a, a popular opinion on most i just don't buy that anymore when the more i get into this stuff i'm like this is some really intricate deep level stuff that they're writing here oh yeah yeah you cannot be an illiterate goat herder and create these sorts of stories this requires uh, education, deep thought, reflection. Uh, it might not be right, but you can see that there's a brilliant exactly. thought process. Exactly. Like yeah. there's just moments where you're like, wow, that didn't really pan out well for them. Like, but they said this, but this actually happened. But the, the thought process behind it is extremely high level. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. Right. All right. So, uh, so here's a few other things that I've also realized along the way. So this scene uh, taking place in heaven. So the heavenly setting is clear because, you know, it says it's a sign in heaven. If she's standing on the moon, if the moon is at her feet, she's then basically literally at the border between the heavenly realm and the um, lower realm. Like usually the moon is like considered like the barrier between like the firmament and like the first heaven. Which then, of course, would also make sense if we're told Satan is also in the sky, but somehow can't quite get to this woman because, you know, it says that Satan or like the, the dragon there wants to consume the child, but somehow can't. Well, what if it's because she's basically literally behind the heavenly wall? She's on one side of the uh, boundary. Now, the other thing is in this, in Psalm, uh, sorry, in Revelation 12, there's also saying how she's pregnant with a king and it quotes Psalm 2 verse 9. Here's what's interesting about that. Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 are both considered coronation psalms. They were supposed to be part of the coronation process for the Jewish king. And we think they're very ancient. Uh, they were commonly read together. Again, in Hebrews, we actually see the two being like cited right one after the other, citing them both together. And earlier in the book of Revelation, in uh, chapter two of that, there is first this quote of Psalm 2-9, the same thing that's quoted here, and then saying how Jesus, and then brings up the morning star. And also in Second Peter, 
that is, you know, someone pretending to be Peter. He's describing the transfiguration, but what he quotes is Psalm 2, 7, and then mentions Jesus, the morning star. Hmm. In other words, Psalm 2, morning star, Psalm 2, morning star. What's happening here in Revelation 12? Psalm 2 is cited, birth of the morning star. Wow. And also it looks like Psalm 110 is a big part of this because yeah, not only does it then say how um, the child is then brought up to heaven uh, and to sit at the right hand side of God. Isn't that exactly how Psalm 110 starts where he says, Psalm 110 uh, you know, says rule over your enemies. Your, yours is yep. princely power from the day of your birth. Mm -hmm. Birth. Yep. And then he says in your holy splendor, the morning star. Mm -hmm. Like Melchizedek. Like, yep. It's all there. And in verse one, it says, you know, uh, sit at my right hand side, which is exactly what Jesus, this baby Jesus does. He ascends right up to heaven right after this birth. And then right after that, there's a war in heaven. If you look, read the last part of Psalm 110, it sounds like basically the king going to war and like cracking lots of heads. And guess what? In the Dead Sea Scrolls in uh, uh, 11Q Melchizedek, one of these Dead Sea Scrolls, it looks like all this discussion of Melchizedek and discussions of Psalm 110, and it also includes a war in heaven against Belial, mm -hmm. led by Michael, the archangel. Right. Again, exactly that. what happens here. Completely forgot about that. That's a big, that's got to be the, see that, that's what the genre was from, let's say 200 BC. All right. Let's say the Seleucid period to about 200 AD. This was like the thing. This was like the pop music. This was like the, the end crowd was doing this. They're making all these apocalyptic wars in heaven literature of Michael, the prince or the Messiah or the battles between light and darkness and all that stuff. That was like, and that's how, that's another reason why you cannot date Daniel pa past 200 BC. You can't like you can't, right. it fits right in. It literally fits right in like a glove. It's like taking a song from the eighties. Like, think of the most eighties song you can think of, like the most pop rock song from the eighties, cocaine sound and music. Like, you know what I'm talking about <laughs> that, you know, the eighties sound. Imagine if someone was like, yeah, this is from, the year 500 AD, you'd be like, get the hell out of here. It's got rock and roll in it. And like, what are you talking about? It's not from 500 BC. This is from 1975. That's what it's like when you try to date Daniel. Pack. Exactly. Yeah. And then, that, yeah. It'd be like saying someone found an old lost uh, play of Shakespeare and it has a character say, yo dog, what's up? <laughs> right. That's, that's exactly what it is. Like it's just, just <laughs> obvious. Uh, yeah. All right. So at this point, it looks like Psalm 110 explains a lot of the interesting details in Revelation 12. It explains the birth from a dawn goddess. It explains a war in heaven. Uh, it explains this uh, figure uh, ascending to uh, the throne with God. Uh, and the interesting thing is, uh, it seems like there also might be some uh, details that are an interesting combination. So the woman has the moon at her feet, she's clothed with the sun, and I think she's giving birth to the morning star. This combination of sun, moon, and morning star is also seen, uh, again, I mentioned the book of Sirach in, uh, what, what chapter was that? Chapter uh, 50. The interesting thing is this combination of comparing the priest that's emerging from the temple on Yom Kippur, who is atoning for sin, by the way, just like oh, Jesus. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this person leaves there and he's compared to the sun, the moon, and the morning star. It's wow. an interesting combination. And in fact, archaeologically, it's a really interesting Sirach? combination. Yes, Sirach, chapter 50. And this combination of sun, moon, and bright star also appears in this interesting bit of archaeology. Wow. So this is from a catacomb in Rome. It's underneath a villa. It's dated, um, I've usually seen it's dated to the 3rd century AD. You can tell it's Jewish because you by see the, the way, two menorahs. By the way, the author's name is Jesus, too. Jesus. Oh, yep. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus leaving the temple on uh, Yom Kippur after doing sacrifices uh, for sin. Wow. Sound familiar? Wow. <laughs> and also compared to the morning star. And also in this bit of archaeology, we see here the two menorahs here, so we can definitely tell it's a Jewish setting. Also, in the middle. Written, also written in the same time period, 200 mm -hmm. to 175 BC. Yeah, so it, yeah. Fits, it fits the genre. It fits, you could see, oh, yeah. you're putting it all together, you could, as you could tell. Mm -hmm. And so the interesting thing here I've noticed with this, so in the middle, it looks like uh, the Holy of Holies, 
Um, it's opened up. It's kind of hard to tell. It's a little bit damaged. But in there, it looks like there's a bunch of scrolls. It's, uh, you know, the, the sacred text of the Jews. So we have the Holy of Holies opened up. Basically, it's the temple open. Like something is coming out of the temple. And on the left and right above that uh, Holy of Holies, you see the sun on one side, the moon on the other, obscured a bit with clouds. And right above that, an eight-pointed star. Yes, that's the Venus. That's the Ishtar symbol, right? So if you're going to depict the morning star, it almost is always an eight-pointed star. Uh, other stars can also be depicted with eight points. But basically, if you're trying to represent the morning star, it has to be eight-pointed, basically. So it's not it's not like a slam dunk morning star, but it it fits exactly the description in the book of Sirach. By the way, a lot of the early Middle Ages artists. Now I get now before anyone crucifies me for saying this, I, I I'm fully aware. I'm not stupid. I fully fully aware that every artist is their own thing. So it's not like the church made all these paintings. They're they're all separate artists. I get that. Okay, but but just look in the middle. Look at her medallion. There's mm -hmm. the pointed star. It almost seems like a lot of the early paintings, even medieval painting, even later on, they, there's always an, a, a, uh, some sort of a, an attempt to identify Mary with the eight pointed star of Venus, which I think is from maybe from maybe from Revelation 12. Maybe that's a thing. But then you have, you'd have to argue how did all the artists know this? Hmm. And you have to look into where the artists are coming from, who's funding the artists. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just throwing that out there for thought for people to think about like i think it's interesting all right yeah that is that is also a very good observation um yeah. i'll make a couple more as well about this catacomb so the fact that it shows the sun and moon a bit obscured behind clouds but only that star above it seems to be big bright and unobscured that seems to actually be derived um at least the commentaries i've read derived from uh isaiah 60 19 and 20 where it says that basically in the new holy jerusalem uh, there will be no need for the sun or moon this, that God will provide the light. And so that seems to be what's going on here. The sun and moon are obscure. They're no longer necessary. The true bright light uh, of the Almighty is what we need. And also, this same sort of sentiment you can find in Revelation 21, where it says, in the new heavenly Jerusalem, there is no sun or moon, for Jesus as the great lamp will provide the light for this world. By the way, Jesus is the morning star. <laughs> right. So this powerful combination, and again, this is an opening of a temple, and then you have sun, moon, and morning star. Again, what happened in chapters 11 and 12, the temple opens up, this woman appears with the sun, moon imagery, and then seems to be giving birth to the morning star. All the imagery seems to fit together extremely well. Right. So this is the stuff that gets me excited and think I might be, well, I am crazy, but I might be on a right track while being crazy. <laughs> Now you said you're bringing this to pre-review, some of the stuff that you want to present. Yeah. So this, yeah, this particular argument about Revelation 12 and the pressure behind it of Psalm 110 and the Star Prophecy that I'm going to be presenting in November at SBL this year. Wow. Good luck. I hope you. Yeah. Hope and then I'll find out if people say, um, "Okay, that's interesting," versus "That's boring," versus "Here are ten things you are totally wrong about." <laughs> yeah, that's how that's how this thing works, man. Exactly. Yeah, I'm presenting it now. So if anyone in the you know scholarly community is out there watching this again get in touch with me to give uh, criti uh criticism or anything else because i need it i want it if i'm totally wrong i'm happy to trash this but i think the evidence is at least enough to say it's plausible to keep examining look man there's nothing better than putting it out there testing the testing a hypothesis when i started this channel not even a year ago last summer in july i had some crazy wild opinions and ideas and hypotheses that i thought were good i was very into roman providence stuff mm. vespasian stuff all that i was into i was just all over the place and i by 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 throwing myself out there to the public to be tested and commented on and and debated it couldn't have been a better thing that ever like i you learn that way I agree. I agree. I, mean, I have one met. I have won so many arguments with shampoo bottles in the shower, but that is not <laughs> translated to the real world. <laughs> right, right. That's that's a fact. I just pictured. Yeah. I just pictured Billy Madison right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, oh, yeah. Now you're making me think of actual good Adam Sandler movies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So.
I think at least I have a good hypothesis for where the imagery of the morning star comes from, from this Pesher method. It can explain what is going on in Revelation. But still, there is the question then, how might it also relate to our other sources? So in particular, how does it relate to Ignatius and Jesus as a star? How does it relate to the star of Bethlehem and the Gospel of Matthew? So again, this is uh, uh, in this uh, slide I, here. I didn't showing the two. I, I'm, 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 no, no, no. You actually, right. you read my mind and went ahead correctly. So, uh, <laughs> so we proved, we both proved the pressure behind this and we proved the existence of psychic powers. <laughs> nice. It's a good night. It's a good night. Yes. Breakthroughs. All right. Breakthroughs. All right. So again, we have our two major hypotheses of how this might work, that there's maybe two disparate ideas of stars related to Jesus uh, the one we find in Matthew and then the one we find in Revelation, and they're ultimately separate uh, in some way or form. So to answer this question of which of these models might be correct, is it really the case that maybe they all go back to a singular one? We need to get into source criticism. So I have, you know, some of my uh, the issues with at least earlier attempts at source criticism to, like, read the Gospels and try to figure out um, um, all the different sources that they had. So, um I read more and more of the Gospels like being very inventive, being very creative. They don't need to say, well, you know, this was said by such and such in the oral literature or the uh, the oral storytelling, and I'm going to incorporate it into mine. Uh, more and more, I see them being too clever to just hear whispers and then write them down. They seem to be much more methodical than that, especially the way Matthew structures things. So... Uh, the idea of uh, form criticism in that, that usually has this idea of this oral transmission, and then it gets uh, stitched together by the gospel authors. I've had issues with that. But another way of doing source criticism is comparing the sources we actually have, and then try to derive what's their relationship. That right. is with texts we do have, rather than hypothetical texts that we try to reconstruct. And if we do that, I think we can find some interesting results. And by the way, this isn't my results, what I'm going to show here. This is actually what seems to be the majority of the literature on the subject. So in particular, the relationship between Ignatius and Matthew. Again, there's a lot of stuff that's in common between the letters of Ignatius, who was a bishop of Antioch. We think it's the same town that Matthew was writing in, in part because they have so much in common. Sometimes like absolutely verbatim stuff. Uh, Ignatius is the first person to mention the virgin birth of Jesus. Uh, there's, you know, things that look like exact quotes from the Gospel of Matthew. But the interesting thing is, since the 1950s, uh, study after study has looked at this and said the best conclusion is that Ignatius is not actually using the Gospel of Matthew. Really? But he knows Matthew's sources. And the interesting thing is, if we then look at what Ignatius says about this star, it has nothing to do it seems like with the birth of Jesus and Herod and all the things that we have from the nativity story, what it says in uh, the, his letter to the Ephesians chapter 19 or section 19, it talks about first how things were being kept hidden from the devil. And these things included Jesus's um, birth, his virgin birth, his passion, all these things were supposed to be kept hidden. And then finally, he is revealed to the world. And how is he finally revealed? As this star where the sun, moon, and other stars are dancing around them and singing in chorus to the bright new star that has come and has now basically completely upset the entire universe and all the demonic powers. That is what Ignatius says in what's called the Star Hymn in uh, chapter 19 of his letter to the uh, Ephesians. Obviously, it sounds absolutely nothing like what happens in the Bethlehem story. Right. And on the other hand, when it comes to Revelation, you know, the first instinct might say, hey, there are a lot of places where there seem to be almost exact quotes between Revelation and specifically the Gospel of Matthew. But again, I've actually found that most of the major uh, studies on this, the ones that are in depth on this, come to the conclusion that Revelation is not using Matthew as a source. Again, they seem to be using common sources or common traditions. Yeah. Now, what does John say about Jesus as a star? Well, he definitely upsets, you know, the demonic forces, you know, he you know, absolutely, you know, defeats Satan at the end. But the interesting thing as well to note in Revelation 12, where it seems to be depicting the birth of Jesus. I don't think that's the birth of Jesus. Really? It's the rebirth. Explain. When Jesus 
became the son of God, according to Paul in Romans 1.14, he became the son of God because of his resurrection from the dead. Oh. Jesus is born again. So what was his, what was he, how was he, he was alive, he was alive before that then, you're saying? So if you, and, and it's worth noting, like before you get to Revelation 12, you have all these descriptions of the lamb who had been sacrificed, whose neck was broken, who was bleeding, and then uh, use all these rituals within the um, holy temple as sin sacrifice. In other words, doing the Yom Kippur ritual as the lamb who had been slain. Oh. Everything up to Revelation 12 looks like Jesus has already died. Okay. And now he's performing the final rituals in the Holy of Holies before emerging. And it's also worth noting in Hebrews, it's specific and says that Jesus entered the temple only one time. One time entered the holy temple, uh, the heavenly temple to offer his blood for sacrifice and then left that um, forever. What happens in Revelation 11? The temple uh, uh, in heaven blows open. Then you see the woman giving birth after Jesus had already done all these other sacrifice things. I think the imagery here is not the birth of Jesus, because why is Jesus being born at the moon? But this is being resurrected and ascending in heaven. Okay, I get what you're saying now. It makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, so I think that fits Revelation and the imagery there and like Paul's theology, what's said in the Epistle of the Hebrews, it fits that context, I think, overall better. Hmm. Um, it's also then a bit weird if it were actually the birth of Jesus, because according to, for example, um, Ignatius, the birth of Jesus was hidden from Satan. In Revelation 12, Satan clearly knows what's up. He is trying to devour the child that's about to be born. That's definitely not hidden. Yeah. On the other hand, Ignatius says the way that Jesus became known was by becoming this bright star and upsetting all of heaven. So to me, I'm looking at this and saying, hey, it's the same myth. <laughs> it's about the resurrected Jesus as a star. Right. Uh, you also find the same thing in the Ascension of Isaiah, that uh, when Jesus is descending, he has to hide himself and look calmly as a human. But... After his death, when he comes back to life, he will no longer look like a human. He will transform back into his much more elegant, angelic, stellar body. Okay. Makes sense. So this seems to be what is the common myth, that it seems like Revelation Ignatius have some sort of underlying source or theology where Jesus becomes a star or appears as a, a star, and specifically the morning star, at his resurrection. And then, and that he upsets the demonic powers and basically brings the end of the world eventually. And also, again, all those other studies suggesting that Revelation and Matthew have a common source. Ignatius and Matthew have a common source. If this source is in common with Revelation and Matthew, or sorry, in Revelation and Ignatius, and these two sources seem to have common sources with Matthew, that ups the probability a lot that Matthew could be using the exact same source as well for his story so are you, are you hinting at a q type of thing or a mark so um <laughs> it, it'd be more q in that that's case a, because it's not derived from mark okay um, yeah uh though the big difference is unlike q where it's uh reconstruction uh based on arguments whether uh matthew knew luke or not um in these cases i'm building on the other studies that do suggest that Revelation and Ignatius aren't using Matthew, may not even know the Gospel of Matthew, but since they have these commonalities, they must have some sort of common theological source behind there. Mm. Okay. So, th and, th and like I say, these studies were mostly independent on the whole um, Jesus as star story. It's, it's many other quotes that they look to and say, um, similarities, but not uh, common sourcing. Gotcha. So building on that, it makes it seem like, okay, if Revelation and Ignatius are telling the same story about Jesus as a morning star upsetting, you know, demonic forces, could Matthew be deriving from that as well? Now, obviously, Matthew's story is very different, but I think he kind of gives the game away. And it's a phrase that, honestly, I had ignored for the longest time until I realized how it's actually important. The Magi, when they are coming, they say they, they have seen his star at its rising or at its morning rising. Is that coin that I was Oh, yeah, we got some coins, of course. Now, oh, yeah. That's Venus. That's the eight-pointed star of Venus. By right. the way, a lot, of, a lot of the coins that are also the same as this have the two that are lateral, too. Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry horizontal, I mean. 
Is that mm. that? Yeah. So they have the whole eights. The, and, the, and, the, and this particular one, it's the Divius Ilius that is the mm. uh, horizontal ones. But yeah. Oh, yeah. You can see them up there. Yep. I have a collection of their. Some of them are for Julius Caesar and some of them are for Caesar Augustus, Augustus right. uh, where he also is divinized as a star. Yeah. And by the way, the, uh, the this is I just found this out. The at the Vatican, there is a uh, Egyptian obelisk from Egypt that they brought. They literally took this thing all the way from Egypt. Must have been an insane job to do that. To try not to break this thing. Anyways, they, they did it. And uh, the obelisk is sitting in the middle of St. Peter's Square has on it the divine Julius, the son of divine Ilya or divine august or i think it says octavian or something anyways it's got divine julius divine octavian and then the son of of the son tiberius son of god so tiberius is not a son of god in that time period <laughs> he's the one who brought and and the story goes that julius caesar is the one who who went to the battle of actium no no not, not, not about the battle of actium augustus battle of actium defeats mark antony and cleopatra he gets, he finds that uh, obelisk, says this is now Rome's obelisk, but he doesn't take it back right away. He leaves it in Egypt for like uh, 60 years or something like that. Tiberius is the one who goes and takes, brings it back to, to Rome, puts it in front of the Vatican. And then later on, the story, there's a legend that I don't think is true. I don't think anyone even believes it. But the story is that St. Peter was hung on that obelisk. The cross <laughs> that he was killed on was on that obelisk. So it's like, that's just, think about all the things that tie into this. The rock of the church. So you got an obelisk. You have Peter getting getting uh, getting crucified on this obelisk. It's from Egypt. I don't know. There's a lot of weird thoughts that go come to my head when I think of this. But I don't think Peter actually did get killed on that thing. I think it's just a later legend. Yeah, I would probably guess that's a later legend too. But uh, the idea, of course, Peter being the rock and he's hung from this rock obelisk. It seems like the sort of poetry. Where the church uh, is, by the way. Yeah, just yeah. have to where the church is, the Vatican. Yeah, it, it, it seems like that's like how such a myth would be created. Somebody exactly. starts with basically a pun and then the pun becomes real. <laughs> yes, and that's, and that's the, I think a lot of Christian stories are brought up that way. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yes. All right. All right. Oh, so, yeah. Calling the star of Bethlehem his star, the star of Jesus. The thing that set me off and I realized there was something weird there because that's not something you would see in something in astrology. In an astrological text, it never talks about a person having a star in their horoscope or uh, they point to a star and say that this is, you know, uh, this person's or that person's star per se. This is actually rather weird. And the examples of where I find this particular construction of talking about like saying this is the star of this person or this is his or her star, I could only find a couple examples of that when it comes to people. One of them is with Julius Caesar, the star that's seen after his death. It is called Caesar's star um, in Virgil's Aeneid. It's called the star of the father because it's talking about Augustus. So this is the star of his father, Julius Caesar. And by the way, when you read Orban's Metamorphosis, he makes it clear that Julius Caesar became a god, ascended into heaven. He he's he he's uh on his funeral pyre. He's raised up by Venus and brought onto his throne. And then right then and there, because of his will, the will of Julius Caesar is to, be his, to beget his son, uh, who is Octavian. So Augustus is begotten by God. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing also worth noting. All these times that they're talking about Caesar's star or his star, it's also worth noting, remember, that according to the Roman propaganda, that star wasn't just a star to represent Caesar. That star was Caesar. That was his soul ascending yes. to heaven. Yes. Yep. That's crazy. And if you go about 150 or so years later, uh, you find another figure uh, named uh, Antinous. This was a young lover of the Emperor Hadrian. Yes. And he on a trip, deified. he was deified too. Yep, yep, yeah. Uh, ba the basic story was he was taking a pleasure trip with Hadrian on the Nile in Egypt. Somehow he falls into the Nile and drowns. And Hadrian is just so distraught. Um, he's being comforted by like the priests that are with him, and they say, um, uh, "Look up, we see that there's a new star in the sky. That's that's the uh, that's uh, Antinous's soul rising to heaven. He's become a god." Wow. 
And again, the construction there, it refers to that star as uh, the star of Antinous. Um, it uses this same sort of construction to say it was star of this person. But again, according to our sources like Cassius Dio, that star was said to actually be the soul of Antinous. Wow. So when you see someone say his star, that should make you think that person is that star. Right. You also find the same thing if we go back to Jewish literature. So in the Testament of Levi, uh, it talks also about this bright star who's supposed to be the uh, high priest that's going to, you know, you know uh, bring all the good things to the world. And again, it referred to as his star, the star of the priest. This The priest is this bright star, and that's the bright, and that is the star of the priest. So when you say his star or the star of that person, you are saying that star is the person. This is also the common interpretation of Numbers 24, 17. Uh, it's clearly talking about a king or messiah figure there, and that's how it's understood in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's how it was understood in the Bar Kokhba revolt. The star in that prophecy is a person. So if the star prophecy is, you know, behind what's going on here, if everyone thinks, you know, Matthew is using the star prophecy, but the star is supposed to be a person, then it really seems to be ringing all the bells to say when it says the star of Jesus, it's saying the star is Jesus, which right. some Christians actually did interpret that. Sure. Why not? So this is kind of giving away the game that Matthew is deriving from this earlier source that has Jesus as the bright morning star. I, makes sense. Yeah, so it looks like, you know, Revelation and Ignatius are both talking about a bright morning star upsetting the cosmic balance. In Matthew's story, there's a bright morning star that is supposed to be the star of Jesus. And of course, it causes all sorts of consternation when the Magi show up. Sure. So to me, it looks like it's the same source being used in all these three places. So I think the model on the left is the most conformant with the studies on the relationship between Matthew, Revelation, and Ignatius. And as for Second Peter, which also mentions uh, Jesus as the morning star, I am very sure that Ignat that um, Second Peter knows the Gospels because he's basically quoting from the Transfiguration story. So he almost certainly knows the Gospel of Matthew. And the fact that he calls Jesus the morning star, that he also cites Psalm 2 after that, just like uh, John of Patmos did, I would say more likely than not, Second Peter is also using Revelation as uh, inspiration, if not a source. Makes sense. So this, I think, then is the model that it all goes back to this earlier myth of Jesus as a star. Now, if this is true, though, this actually makes something a bit interesting. Matthew's star is... Clearly, no, not acting as Jesus. It's supposed to still be separate from him, acting as his guide. So what this looks like is Matthew knows the earlier source, and now he has euhemerized it. That's your argument, right? Mm-hmm. Ah, I caught you. <laughs> no, you got me. Yeah, it's a good argument, though. I, I like that. I could make, it makes sense. It would be... Big for mythicists, and this is true. Uh, when it comes to that, there are a few things to note. I honestly don't think this changes the arguments for mythicism that much for a few reasons. One, because I'm arguing that the nativity story is even less historical, doesn't really change things because most Bible yeah. scholars already figured this isn't historical. It's sure. not like I've proven the, the the crucifixion didn't happen. That's not what's happened here. Yeah, you're, um, you're right. Yeah. And most importantly, I think that you could still believe that this story is euhemerized and this, uh, you know, fits that model of taking cosmic myths and putting them on Earth, but still think there's an historical person if you think Paul is talking about an historical Jesus. Basically, sure. the model could be that Jesus was a dude. He was effectively deified very quickly by the time Paul comes on board. Myths are created about the deified Jesus, and then the later gospel authors then start taking those myths and putting them on Earth. Sure. This would mean the Gospels have very, very little connection to the historical Jesus. Yeah. But it would still be consistent with there being a historical Jesus. So ultimately, sure. this argument can't prove mythicism. Yeah. On the other hand, 
I think it does justify, for example, uh, Richard Carey's idea that the Gospels are euhemerizations of Christ's myth. If I can show this is like one example and say, hey, here's the earlier source. We can derive it from these other um, non-Gospel sources and then see how Matthew has euhemerized it. Then it makes it much more plausible that that's the sort of strategy the Gospel authors did have. It won't prove mythicism. What it would do is just show that that premise that Carrier uses is justified.